Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I'm going to be looking at an interesting topic, um, one which I'm surprised I haven't looked at before, but Lower Deck Season 3 has prompted me to take a fresh look at this, this area in the lore of Trek, and also something that has some interesting real-world implications, and that is drones in Trek, or automated starships. We'll get into the specifics of it. Now, I think an accusation some may make is that Star Trek is a bit technologically behind the times and doesn't recognise the importance of drones. Drones are often seen as something novel in Star Trek as this strange thing when, you know, drones are already ubiquitous, well, becoming increasingly ubiquitous and important today. You know, my own mother likes to say, oh, well, you know, real realistically, all sci-fi, all Star Trek, it would all be drones. And I'm like, mm, no, it wouldn't. Well, for starters, we wouldn't have a sci-fi show. That's one problem. But then the other, there are other problems which we'll get into. And it's one of those things that, you know, can sometimes exist in the universe without understanding the rules of the universe. Take, for example, the long-range torpedoes in Star Trek Into Darkness. Um, they're basically meant to be a stand-in for beyond visual range missiles or cruise missiles, stuff like that. You know, stuff that can strike from really far. And it's like, yeah, but space is way bigger than Earth. There are real problems with, with that a weapon like that. You probably couldn't even see as far as your weapons need to go. So you could only ever fire at fixed targets. Won't go into that. We're not here to discuss beyond sensor range. Uh torpedo weapons. We're here to discuss drones and automated starships. So, unmanned vessels would be the correct term. So, first thing I want to do is look at the history of unmanned vessels in Trek. So, we can go way back to TOS. Yeah, yeah, Trek isn't that far behind the times. This was made in the 1960s when most people didn't even know or think that much about unmanned systems i mean it was it was talked about but it wasn't particularly a particularly prominent area of technology and was quite limited in its scope so we have two from tos we have the antares class which is both of these are featured in the episode the ultimate computer you have the antares class which is a robot cargo ship there's basically this unmanned cargo ship that just goes from point a to point b at low speeds ferrying various forms of cargo. Nice idea, actually. I really like it. There's a lot of automation in original series. Um, and a lot, like, um, there's, I think it's the Where No Man Has Gone Before episode, where they visit the planet where Kirk eventually does battle with the the guy with the power of, with the power of a god. And, but the, the, the planet is all, like, largely automated. All the terraforming equipment is largely automated. And there's, like, a handful of people there to, to supervise it. And then in the same episode, The Ultimate Computer, we have the M5 Artificial Intelligence. This is modelled on a human brain. And there are already interesting concepts to bring up here, notably input bias. So with input bias, it's basically, it's, and, you know, the episode deliberately acknowledges this that the the m5 is is flawed is a flawed mind because it is based on dr daystrom who is human and thus has a flawed mind and it's a good little good little uh episode good story I liked it a lot i didn't like how that i'm just gonna i'm just gonna make a little aside here the little tangent here I hate how that episode ends. It's so weird. So, you know, the, the Lexington has been destroyed. The, like, a Starfleet vessel has been destroyed, and then another ship has been heavily damaged in the battle with the M5-controlled Enterprise. It's pretty serious. And then, like, Dr. Daystrom, under, like, basically has a mental breakdown as well. Um, and, and then the episode ends with um, Spock making a joke. And it was like, yes, Dr. McCoy, if you if you were to be hooked up to a computer, then uh, then the torrent of illogic would be most amusing. And then they all share a laugh on the bridge. And I'm like, wait, hang on, like 600 people are dead. <laughs> this doesn't feel like the time to be cracking a joke. This is a minor thing. Sometimes the sitcom endings in um, TOS land, and sometimes they really don't. And that was one of those ones where it's like, oh, that, that doesn't work. Anyway, moving on. In Next Generation, there isn't actually that much in the form of uh, 
artificial intelligence or unmanned starships. We have various forms of alien probes which are basically robotic minds. They're basically just waiting for the Enterprise to show up and, and kick off the plot. Not much to say about that. Uh, from Voyager, from what I know of Voyager, I haven't seen all of Voyager. There's the Caretaker Array, which is effectively a robot. It basically is just there to automate a process. And then you have the Dreadnought Missile, which is an AI and is adaptive. It's it's clearly demonstrated an ability to grow beyond its original programming, uh, as mandated by Belana Torres, and that's well, that's why that's a problem in the episode. Then we get to Enterprise, and in Enterprise we have the first proper drone, the Romulan drone, the remote control. Now it's the only, this is the only remote control vessel we see, and there's a good reason for that, and that's that this really shouldn't work. You see, those of you who watched the Tomed incident will note that there is about a, between the starbase on Lyre 4, which is pretty close to the neutral zone, relatively speaking, and the neutral zone border itself, there's about a two and a half hour transmission delay. Okay, so this is two and a half hours, and then let's say the Romulus is another two and a half hours on the other side. It isn't, by the way, it's way more than that. Point I'm making, those distances are vast, and those are very long transmission delays in the 24th century. So how is it that in the 22nd century, this thing can be operated in that region of space, all the way from Romulus, with instantaneous communication. I'll tell you how it can. How it can. It's called it can't. It's called writer's convenience. It's bullshit. The, according to the rules of the universe, that shouldn't be able to happen. Now, you might say that, oh, well, you know, they installed special transceivers. It's like, well, why aren't they using them in the 24th century? Why isn't that technology now ubiquitous and allowing instantaneous communication along vast interstellar distances? No, unfortunately, that's one that just doesn't live up to scrutiny. But it does raise interesting issues when it comes to uh, remote control vessels. In Discovery, we then get the Section 31 ships, which actually, I, I think I've said this before, I actually like these designs in and of, of themselves, not necessarily as Section 31 ships, but it's just like another faction of humans, like a breakaway hu independent faction of humans. I think that it works pretty, they work pretty well for that. Uh, and I do like them, especially the Nimrod. Anyway, uh, these are basically remote control ships directed by AI, but they have, they were originally intended for organic crews, but obviously had the capacity for remote control, and that's how the AI of control huh, was able to take over and operate them. You then have on these ships then smaller drones, which are presumably controlled by the mothership. Anyway, moving on from that, we have then in disc in lower decks, we have the Texas class, which is built from the ground up as an AI-controlled vessel. Texas class, very interesting. I actually have thought about a similar concept the idea of building building a regular size starship but making it so it's just run by a computer and how much like space you would then free up for power generation and engines and weapons and how much more powerful and effective would that be than a you know regular you know manned by squishy humans starship what we can really see here is that there are basically three categories of unmanned vessel in Trek. We have robot ships. Now, there's not really much to critique about robot ships. They're good for simple tasks. They're depicted a lot in original series. Automation is depicted a lot in original series. And they would probably be everywhere. They would probably just be in the background of the universe. It's like, oh yeah, there's a... There's a robot freighter. Oh, there's another robot freighter. You know, sort of unremarkable things. But they're good for very limited and very simple tasks. You know, particularly if you're, if you're just shipping freight around within Federation space where it's all safe. Yeah, it probably works. But if you're shipping freight across, you know, possibly more dangerous areas of space. Well, a robot ship's just... I mean, that's just a free lunch if you're a pirate. Okay, Next one is then remote control. So 
Much like modern drones, you have the problem of communication. Not only is there this transmission delay nonsense, but also the ability for your communication to be intercepted or jammed or, you know, whatever. For a remote control vessel, you would need a locally... Uh, you would need a mothership nearby from where it is being controlled, which somewhat defeats the purpose of having a remote control starship because, of course... If, you know, you're fighting a battle with these remote control starships, well, all that your enemy has to do is is find your carrier, find their mothership, and just destroy that, and then they're useless. Now, they would be good for reconnaissance, and certainly, like, for example, in The Expanse, you know, which is pretty, I'll point out, a pretty realistic bit of sci-fi. But again, not all the ships are drones. The ships have drones that they can deploy, and use them particularly for reconnaissance and to give them extra pairs of eyes, but they don't have, you know, automated vessels um, or remote control vessels, frankly. Uh, it's all still manned platforms. Finally, we've got AI, artificial intelligence. This is the scary one. This is the one sci-fi loves to make about our evil evil robot overlords although that is probably the least realistic depiction i actually think dr daystrom having a mental breakdown with his computer because it's based on him and all of his you know all the baggage he has going on in his brain i think that's actually more realistic because in reality artificial intelligence is only as intelligent as the programmer now there's a lot of things that's interesting in AI. Everyone's talking about AI. Everyone's talking about drones and everyone's talking about AI right now. And people say, oh, AI, it's going to put all of us out of work. It's going to, you know, soon I won't, soon I won't have a YouTube channel. It will just be out of AIs make, will make videos and they will somehow, you know, do it better than me somehow. I'm not entirely convinced that the AI won't just pump out crap. Um, which is probably the more likely scenario. I'll give you an example. Um, so, it, for example, it, th there was one experiment where they were trying to teach an AI the difference between a wolf and a dog. And they thought it had got it, and then they showed a picture of wolf, and then it got it wrong. And it's like, oh, why, why has it got it wrong? Turned out, the AI was actually not looking at whether a thing is a wolf or a dog, it was looking at it on the basis of, is there snow in the background? It was using context clues because it couldn't figure out the difference between a wolf and a dog. We can all figure out a difference between a wolf and a dog somehow. I mean, they are basically very, very similar animals, but somehow we figure out the difference. Don't ask me how, we just do. Now, possibly that's just a, a case of increased teaching. I'll give you another example. Because AI doesn't exist in an embodied form, it doesn't... It doesn't think about things in the way we do, and it doesn't, it doesn't understand things working in the world. So, for example, I remember seeing someone share some AI-created stormtrooper artwork from Star Wars. You know, you take a, you showed the AI a stormtrooper and said, "Draw me this. Draw me various iterations of this from this template." And it was like, okay, and you could see very clearly it had got many things right and 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 at first glance it looked good and then you realized it you realized that the design actually made that the ai had come up with made no fucking sense that it had basically seen oh here's a combination of colors and here and textures and here's a way that we can put them together and we can it sort of did it it basically did it with no understanding of how the thing was meant to work it just saw a combination of colors and textures and, and remixed them in ways that might be, you know, aesthetically pleasing. But it didn't do it with any rhyme or reason or logic behind it. That's a problem with AI. Another problem with not having an embodied AI. So, Data is actually an artificial intelligence. He is an artificial life form. Now, I think the reason why Data acts very differently, well, other than the fact that he's played by Brent Spiner and played by a human and needs to be a character in a TV show, Data is an embodied AI. He is an AI that operates in a, in a humanoid body. Now, while he does have certain things that he can do, it also means that he has to operate in context. He doesn't operate in a vacuum in his own little world. He has to operate in the world of other living beings. 
and thus he has to kind of conform to various forms of he has to do various things in order to you know he can't just go around doing things as he sees fit um because he's got to operate in a world amongst other things that are not him which with ai in computers they don't have to do that but you know that's a thing they do have to do in real world in the real world and you know that's where you know challenges come in and so take that example and then think about the texas class so the texas class you know we'd say oh well it can operate amongst a, a social unit of starships what the fuck is a social unit of starships and in what way would the texas class operate and and act in a way that was kind of consistent with that sort of quote-unquote social community it's an interesting idea but you know would it just operate in ways that we just don't understand because we're not starships we're people who work inside starships we're not starships though so the conclusions that we can really draw about unmanned systems in star trek is that robots are very handy as they are in reality in the real world they are very very handy they are actually probably better in space than they are with uh, the real world because space is a big empty and there's not much in space. So it's a relatively controlled environment. The trouble with, you know, throwing a robot into the real world, particularly an outside the lab environment or, you know, a, a pre-studied course or something, is that there's a, there's a whole load of things going on and the robot's got to somehow discriminate this information between what is and isn't important. Uh, to its operation and we do that because our brain just you know we because we evolved over thousands over millions of years to do that robot doesn't do that robot you know has to you know has to do that every time i mean i remember seeing uh, the the i think it was built by honda the asimo robot and it walking up the stairs i mean we just walk up the stairs as is asimo had to stop look at the stairs really look at the stairs and then do it one two, one, two, one, two, over a, you know, short set of sets. We just do it, and but, you know, the robot has to make all these calculations about, you know, balance and weight and where its, its foot needs to be. But that's less of a problem in space. Drones have a very limited use because of transmission range and transmission delay. So there's not really much scope. Again, for some reconnaissance, they might be somewhat helpful, possibly. We will probably discover these same issues with drones in the real world. I know everyone's saying everything is going to be drones. It's all going to be drones. As I point out, well, for starters, not only do automated systems have really struggle with the real world. I mean, they, and they'd really struggle with a battlefield. My goodness. Aerial drones have a lot of advantages. Again, there's not much in the sky. You know, you can kind of make the argument, again, in, in the form of remote control vessels in Trek, that remotely controlling a vessel from a couple light years away is no different from actually operating it, because at the end of the day, you'd still be looking through a view screen, you know, on planets in the world. Looking at something in real life and looking at something on a view screen is very different, and actually I do wonder... You know, if you were to take a drone pilot, put him on a ground-based drone system, you know, a little, little mini tank with little treads and a machine gun, and told him to go out and find targets and such, he might actually very much struggle because looking at the world through a screen is not the same as being there in reality sort of thing. Um, so he'd probably miss a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, Humans weren't meant to see things up. We're not bad at seeing things 10,000 feet in the air, sort of, kind of. But we're much better at seeing things on the ground. And again, losing that perception is sort of an issue. Then finally, when we come to AI, AI is very finicky. Scientists say, oh, we're very close to artificial intelligence. We're very, very close to sort of, you know, self-aware artificial intelligence. They say the same damn thing about fusion about fusion reactors and here we are 20 years later when they said it was only five years away and it's still only five years away i wouldn't hold my breath on 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 advanced ai i know that's what everyone's talking about because the press like it i, I still see it being quite far off and then when it comes to in universe you know 
can AI imagine? Can it self-reflect? Can it doubt itself or empathize? That's another thing, actually. Um, tactical empathy. So there's a whole, you know, this is an area of tactical psychology, but there's also an area of tactical empathy. TOS is very keen on this idea. If you think about the episode Balance of Terror, Kirk is engaging in tactical empathy. He's thinking, okay, if I was the Romulan captain, what would I do if I was in his position? AI can't do that. AI can go through previous scenarios and say, well, in this scenario, this happened, and in this scenario, this happened. And it can and it can make an estimation of what possibly might happen. Uh, but then it's just a way of saying, okay, well, all you need to do is act unpredictably. Whereas, you know, when you're dealing with another flesh and blood mind it's it's a much more doable thing and it's a much more of a thing of like okay well here's the thing that i could predictably do and here's the thing that i could do that's sort of adjacent to that and then here's the sort of the wild card thing i could do and that's 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 a big area i think that is that is very much shown in in tos and um you know it's 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 mind against mind sort of thing it's chess game well there's episodes of tos and there's episodes of tng I'll go with TNG because Data is actually a, an AI. There's episodes of TNG where Deanna Troy beats Data at chess because she just goes completely irrational. And he's like, what? what, what, what? Yeah, it's a, little, it's a little fun thing. Um, but those are, those are really my thoughts about unmanned systems in Star Trek. So uh, let me know what you guys think. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you all for watching. I will now thank my members, my Navarks, David Reeves, Jeffrey Ballard, and Tully DT, my commanders, Miami Jules, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blus, Adam Bowman, and Nathaniel Mead. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Paul Lash, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Freedom Trooper, Ococatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, and Gabe Logan. And I welcome all my new sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.